Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to the uh, kelp restoration in Monterey uh, kelp working groups. So there are a couple opportunities here and we're going to talk about those this evening. <laughs> Your presenters tonight will be two of us. You're, you're doubly lucky today. You have uh, uh, myself, I am Keith Rootsart with the Giant Giant Kelp Restoration Project. I'm a conservationist and much more charismatic. Alyssa Bellamy, uh, who is from Bamboo Reef and a G2KR instructor, and uh, she'll be joining us uh, a little bit later on in, in the meeting. So uh, we have to talk about the backstory a little bit because um, we don't know the background of everybody here in the meeting. So uh, basically, kelp needs cold, nutrient-rich water. And when there was kelp, less kelp debris drifting into the cracks where urchins normally live, the urchins ran out of food. They came out of cracks and moved into the kelp forest. And these urchins began eating the hold fast where the kelp is attached to the reef. And the entire kelp rips up and ends up washing onto the beach. In less than three years, many pristine kelp forests in Monterey went from this to this, just being an urchin baron. And we now have urchin barons throughout South Monterey Bay and down through the Big Sur coast further south. In South Monterey Bay, uh, we have a kelp crisis going on. I, the divers certainly know this. We used to have approximately 487 acres of giant kelp forests uh, in Monterey. Uh, and that was before the marine heat wave. But uh, this image on your right was taken in September of last year and only 58.3 acres of kelp remained uh, in South Monterey Bay. And, and one thing I would say is that this 11 acres of kelp down here, this is where the Tankers Reef Project is. And we'd have even less kelp if it wasn't for this garden uh, that we made over at Tankers Reef. So this is where the urchin barrens are around the peninsula. This is uh, from surveys and from own personal observations. Uh, pretty much the entire peninsula has these urchin barrens all around it. And this is where the urchin larvae the urchins, there's males and females and they spawn and the urchin larvae go out and 30 to 60 days they settle out and become urchins with the California currents. This nest of the Monterey Peninsula spread urchins all down the Big Sur coast for 100 miles, all the way to Morro Bay. So here's the poll and I'm going to put it in the chat. Right. So there is the, the, the poll right there. We ask everybody who's online. We usually don't, would not have you do this, but we want you to start the poll <laughs> and follow along with us uh, on your computer. Maybe if you have two screens, you can do that and have the poll. And we're going to go through the poll with you. And we're going to explain some things about the poll as we go along. So if anybody has difficulty, is not able to do it, um, raise your hand and we'll make sure you, to accommodate it. I don't see any hands raised. I'm gonna go to the next slide here. So in that poll, the uh, it asked you some questions, right? So go ahead and, and fill out those uh, answers now in, in the poll. And um, this is what the header looks like on that page, Kelp Restoration Management Plan, background and constituent demographics questions. So a little background of what we're doing here is we're trying to get a diver opinion poll and we're trying to establish what are, who are the people that are gonna do this. We're gonna send this poll to all the divers that we know of on these email lists. And uh, we wanna hear what divers opinions are on several subjects that we're gonna go over tonight. So if you can, Please complete that. We will keep your personal information private. Uh, we will not share it with anybody, but um, at the end, we'll ask you if you want to get engaged some more and, and we can, we'll can we use your email to engage you in things that you authorize us to solicit your further engagement on.
pretty good with that. So your years diving, years diving in Monterey, highest level of certification. And any affiliation that you have, like who you would consider your association with. Let's see, okay from people. I'm in, Scott says. Looking good. All right. And and in this process, if if we're going through it and you say, you know, I think that question is leading, or I don't like the question, it's none of your business, let us know and we can change it, you know. Um and we'll have that uh, at the end of this discussion. We'll have some question and answer, and that's a good opportunity to where we can address any issues you have. And that completes the demographic portion. And next part is. Oh, Keith, um, yes. Barbara just joined. <laughs> so do we want to let her know what that was about on the last slide so she can participate in the poll as well? Who just joined? Barbara. Barbara Davis. She oh, just Barbara joined. Davis. Oh, yeah. Barbara. So, uh, Barbara, uh, in the chat is the poll. Uh, it's the first thing in there. And uh, go ahead and click on that poll and uh, complete the demographic information uh, as you learn uh, a little more from Alyssa about uh, the kelp restoration management plan. Cool. Take it yes, away, Alyssa. You. That's your cue. <laughs> um, so if you guys are still working on that first little bit of the poll while I'm first talking, that's totally fine. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, but feel free. Oh, um, Keith, while I'm introducing, do you mind just copying and pasting that poll one more time into there? It looks like Barbara can't find it quite yet. Oh, sure. She yeah. might have joined after it was posted. Oh, that's true. Good point. There it is. Perfect. My bad. All right. So if anybody else was a little behind, go ahead and get started there. Um, basically, I was lucky enough to be um, appointed onto this community working group. Big purpose of this group is to help voice the community's overall opinions and uh, suggestions for helping our kelp forests, which I think is why we're all here today. And if you're not, then welcome. You're going to learn a lot about a kelp forest today. Uh, Keith, do you mind going to the next slide? Thank you. All right, so this is our overview, right? This is our general purpose, why we um, had this plan for this group put together in the first place. Uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife got together with the Ocean Protection Council and got enough funding to get this ball rolling, which we'll get into in a little bit here, but I'll have you guys go ahead and kind of read what's on the screen. I'm not one to necessarily read off of slides myself, but I think we, after Pete's little summary of, you know, what the history is, can understand why this was proposed in the first place. But if anybody has any questions, feel free to interrupt me. Otherwise, we'll keep going along to the next slide here. All right. So again, pretty obvious based on Pete's summary earlier why um, this plan is being proposed in the first place or put together. Um, the goals, of course, are to develop to develop a very robust and climate ready approach. As we know, there's a lot of warmer waters right now, whether it's El Nino or not. Uh, we can see that there's a gradual trend towards warmer waters. And as Keith mentioned, kelp like cold nutrient rich water. And that presents us with a problem if we want the kelp forest to stick around. So looking at what efforts have been successful along the state of California, what may not have been successful, maybe why, and seeing if we can mesh those ideas from various communities, not just divers, but also fishermen and other people that have an invested interest in the kelp forest here. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so these are the key components or will be the key components of the kelp restoration management plan. Um, having a kelp harvest framework and a ecosystem-based management plan um, focused on reviving that kelp forest ecosystem and uh, creating a toolkit to do so. Um, if you'd like, Keith, I can also share the first page of the charter for the KRMP, if it's okay for me to share my screen either now or later at the end too. I do have permission just to share the first page, which outlines exactly what you know, is being put forward. So that's totally up to you. 
Um, yeah, why don't we get that at, at the end? Um, yeah, I figured that'd be that. easier. Yeah, because it's a little bit of reading. It's a lot of words on the screen, exactly. right? Yeah, Lots so that, yeah. Um, I wanted to also mention that all of the details in the charter will be publicly shared. So this whole process is going to be very transparent with the public. You know, it's based on public engagement, right? Whatever you are sharing with me at this meeting and future meetings, or if you just stop by the dive shop or see me on the street and you want to talk about kelp, that's my job is to bring that forward to the entire working group, share those ideas, and then the uh, process moving forward will be documented. You know, if those ideas do get passed along, that's going to be tracked through the minutes, which are going to be publicly available through the KRMP website, and you'll be able to see why something was or was not included moving forward as the plan keeps moving on. All right, next slide here. And it's not just us that are doing any kind of input. The other groups that are mentioned, they're having a big hand in it too. Um, like I mentioned, we got funding for this group to be initiated this year. Um, they conducted interviews to find various members across the coast of California to um, represent various community working groups. And then by KRMP 2025, um, the drafting of it should begin if it hasn't already. And then hopefully the entire plan should be finalized in 2026. And then we'll actually start implementing uh, whatever we have decided is gonna be the best course of action to revive our kelp forest in 27. Any questions on anything here, you guys? I, I it sounds like there's going to be almost three different groups. There's there's a scientific, a tribal, and a stakeholder. Yeah, if you want to go back to the previous slide, yeah, there are three separate groups. So I am part of the community working group. There is a separate tribal roundtable group for you know tribal representatives to have their input, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is excellent because we definitely have failed at that. If anybody was at the deca oh. decadal review. You know, you know that we did not value their input back then. So I'm really glad to see that that's in here now. And then a science advisory committee, you know, referencing the ongoing research that's going into health restoration efforts across the coast and elsewhere. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that yeah. It's, it's actually uh, just a, really very aligned with the next part of this. I didn't realize it really was so much. So great. Mm -hmm. And go back to this. Um, Thank you. And then there's this one. Thank you. Um, so this kind of just um, co totally summarizes all that we talked about already um, and kind of going for the next steps, right? So there's this working group and what I'm going to be a part of is four virtual meetings in the next couple of years as we are working through and creating that management plan. And then we will get regular updates from the science advisory committee. <clears throat> I believe there's um, plans to try to have at least a few of their members in all of our community working group meetings. So that way we have uh, current scientific input, which I think is extremely valuable. And then um, again, updates as well from the other group that we're gonna be working cohesively with the tribal roundtable group to make sure that we get their input um, and potentially somebody from their groups representing them um, overall in those meetings as well. Um, and then there will be one in-person meeting at some point in those two years um, as part of, I believe, the overall four group meetings. I'm not sure if it's going to be four plus the one, or I think it was just four total, but either way, there will be one time when we all get together in person because we're all kind of spread out along the coast of California. And then we will, of course, receive regular updates from the government and government consultation. Anything needed to add here? Oh, yes, then back to the poll. So we're gonna jump back over here. Hopefully everybody's done with their introductory questions. And then we're gonna go ahead and answer these first three. And if anybody has questions about what some of the answers would mean, let us know, but just whatever your opinion is. Yeah. So Looking at it, so the first the first question is, what do you see as important priorities for the KRMP? And there's some examples here that are given. And question two is, what are some ex examples of success that you are seeing? 
communications, community engagement, management, approaches, restorations. I think we have a really successful project right here in Monterey at, at Tankers Reef. I think it's a good example of a success, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lead you any further than that. <laughs> and some people may have other success stories that we're yeah, not. Yeah, tell us so about it, free, right? Any and all, please share. What is what is and, and what is your what do you view as success is different than what we view as success? So that's very important. And then question three, what are the current challenges regarding bull and or giant kill? So what's the challenge? Right. Give people a chance to think about that. When you guys are done answering those questions, if you want to just let us know, maybe giving like a thumbs up emoji, if you guys know how to do that on your screens or in the chat, that's fine too, just so we have kind of an idea of how fast people are moving through here. Good point. I think we have one thumbs up. My internet cut out. Could you guys send that link again? I uh, when I got back on, it wasn't showing up in the chat for me. Perfect. I'm sure. I could do, I'm sure I could do it pretty quick. You got it. Thank you. Yeah, I had a problem too. It just sort of disappeared on me. I, I need you to send it to me as well again. Can you see? Can you see the chat? I just put it in the chat again. Roger. Got another thumbs up. Oops. One, two, five. Roll my mouse. Another thumbs up from Lewis Patterson. Barbara Davis says, wow, Julia. Oh, yeah, Julia submitted a <laughs> picture of. Oh, she put that in the chat. That was the screen chat. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Nice. It's a kelp. It's an urchin invasion. Like there's bite marks all the way up the side. Oh. Yeah. We have like a whole library of media of urchins. And one of the things we're doing on the project I thought was kind of cool is we actually go around the perimeter every so often and video it. And so you can see over time in the video, the progression of the kill. Yeah, I put that in my comments of getting more of that sort of content like out to people because... It's like when you dive, you see it and it's so obvious. And if you're not in the water frequently, you you don't even know. You walk right by, you don't even know. It's like a yeah. wildfire raging underwater and no one even knows. 
Yeah, that's pretty cool. Do you mind if I borrow that image, Julia? That's a good one to show people, especially because I like you can see a person down there and it makes you realize just the scope of even just a small area, how many urchins there are. Yeah, I'll send you the link to the whole little video that we did and you can talk to the videographer and photographer and you can ask them directly if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yep. No worries. That's Brandon. That's me. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'll send it to you. Great. Thank you. Wow. That understory kelp with little urchins all over. I see what you mean. Nice. Nice in a bad way. Gets the point across. It certainly does. There's one that Jack Likens likes to share too that has like an abalone with the urchins coming at it like radially, like coming to eat it. It's pretty amazing. I like that one too. So yeah, Barbara asked Julia, where was that taken? Um, that was at a spot um just south of Monastery Beach. It's a little section we call S curve. Very good. Well, we're going to go ahead and, and move on to the next portion uh, of this. Um, click on it. So in addition to what the state is uh, uh, going to do for kelp restoration management groups, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, uh, which is a federally um, con controlled, conserved area between that goes from the um, just south of the Golden Gate Bridge, and it goes all the way down to Cambria in uh, San Luis Obispo County. And the superintendent, uh, Lisa Lunick, has uh, established a work plan for iconic uh, kelp forests and is asking the advisory council people to uh, members to uh, be on these kelp working groups. Well, it's their working group, so anybody is welcome to attend the working group. So you can participate in this directly and be on these committees if you like. Um, this is the international uh, kelp restoration goals. Like globally, uh, the, uh, the target is, there are, there are 10 million hectares of, no, yeah, 10 million hectares of kelp forests in the world. And 5 million hectares of it is degraded. So the goal from the international community is to re restore 1 million hectares of kelp by 2040. And to protect it, which is to stop fishing pressure, whatever you're gonna do to protect things, the 3 million hectares. And they asked for um, people to submit their pledges of how much they are gonna help with that. And that's how we can share information with other communities. There's 23 countries involved in this. It's all over the Northern and Southern hemisphere where these places are, are done. So the iconic kelp plan, uh, uh, they gave us a little background of it and advisory council people can serve on a kelp plan working group. And uh, there will be experts in the process as well. Uh, this is a little information about the, the kelp across various areas of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And, and this is the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. In this image, we call it the, the, the pregnant woman uh, outline. And uh, in this area, north of the Monterey Bay in Santa Cruz area, this is the marine heat wave area uh, time, uh, this little orange rectangle. And the kelp is actually holding up there and recovering after the marine heat wave um, in the Santa Cruz area. There's not urchins there. There's just, the kelp is doing better. Um, in the Monterey area around the peninsula, you can see where after the marine heat wave, it just kind of petered out. There's a little bit of recovery here at the end. And that's probably thanks to us. <laughs> uh, and then there is the uh, area the south of uh, Monterey in the Big Sur coast. And you can see after marine heat wave, there's a little bit of, of movement up and down. Um, but it's probably bull kelp and not giant kelp that is in these areas. Um, that's making it do a rise. They also share with us this picture that they used to harvest kelp for, uh, they use it to dye clothes. And uh, this is a picture taken of, of an old time in Monterey. And this is just all bull kelp um, on this boat, which 
which is kind of interesting if you think about it, because giant kelp was dominant in Monterey, not bull kelp in, in our lifetime. But in in a previous lifetimes, bull kelp was dominant in this place. And so what we're talking about are the different states of, of kelp forest communities. Uh, there is kelp dominated areas. There's transitional areas that go between giant kelp and bull kelp. And then there's urchin dominated environments where this, like in that picture, <laughs> where there's a lot of urchins and they dominate the landscape and um, it's denuded a species uh, in those areas. This is done by someone like Lila Luthi that uh, can help with making illustrations for us. Um, this is what they kind of look like. I think we've all been there, seen that. And in the kelp dominated community, uh, this is a little metrics we have of what that looks like. Temperature would be cold, a high percentage of drift algae in these areas. Uh, urchins are very low, and other grazers are also very low. You can have sea otters, is a high probability of sea otters, and human intervention. Probably not necessary in a, in a, a kelp forest like that. Another area is a transitional kelp community. Um, also, it could be phrased as a transitional urchin community, uh, where the temperature is a little bit warm and there's not much drift algae. Urchins are, there's some urchins in it. Other grazers could be high, like snails could be really high in that kind of environment. There's some sea otters working and predating and human intervention may or may not be necessary. In an urchin dominated community, the temperature really gets warm. We, that's like we've seen, we've had temperatures in the 60s for long, for long periods of time. Uh, drift algae is very low. There's not a lot of algae on the site. Urchins very high in number and other grazers, starfish, snails and so on are is that a middle amount of them. Not much chance of otters work, working in these kind of areas. Otters are clever. They don't uh, mess, waste their time with empty urchins. They, they like to eat urchins in the kelp forest. But human intervention, high probability that this would be the only way to tip that balance back. So there are some current kelp projects that are being worked on. Uh, there's a uh, 13 projects that were uh, introduced. Uh, by the research activity panel uh, to be some research done in Monterey Bay. Um, PISCO is, does monitoring. That's the Partnership for Interscholastic Coastal Oceans, I think. Uh, and at Tankers Reef uh, Monitoring, uh, the, fish, the Monterey Bay Nesmith Marine Sanctuary has been one of our partners in, in monitoring Tankers Reef. And they're looking at some calling impacts and urchin recruitment studies. They basically went around and saw, like, if you swing a hammer, what would happen? Could you kill something if you do that? Um, they're testing drone res resolution, and they're doing coordinating efforts with Fish and Wildlife, the Aquarium, and the Nature Conservancy, and developing critical kelp parameters for the web enabled condition report. They have this, uh, they're developing a a special report portal for the sanctuary. And they outreach through the Santa Cruz Sentinel and public presentations. The purpose is to focus on iconic kelp monitoring, recovery, and restoration as implemented through the sanctuary. And there'll be three different, uh, there's different teams that at the sanctuary and there's each team has its own working group. First one is the research and the second one is outreach and education. There's a lot of education needs to happen around kelp and resource protection. Uh, so what we define where the sanctuary will focus its resources relative to the iconic kelp priority and uh, inform the sanctuary efforts to obtain outside funding and partnerships. That's something that's always, they know more than we do about how to obtain funding for these sort of things. And to inform interested parties about what the sanctuary is doing and to inform uh, the kelp interests about how they can participate in kelp related programs and activities. Um, I will say that I've been on the sanctuary advisory committee for over five years now. And I've, every time we have a break in the action, like I'm talking to people about urchins, <laughs> they just can't help it. And um, 
I, I'm really glad to see that the sanctuary is going to address it after this time and is forming these working groups. It's their first priority of the year and it's all hands on decks to do this. So, so we're gonna, right now there's listing nominations. Uh, I've put a nomination as well uh, to be on these three working group committees. We will uh, solicit your involvement if you say you're interested in this uh, and being on these, or these working groups. We have a conservation and policy working group, outreach education, and research working group. And this is the timeline of how this advisory committee will uh, act upon this. There's, it's going through May, this is recommendations, and then in August, there'll be a final plan uh, for how to implement iconic compost. Um, so these are the, the groups, and I'm just saying them again, participating in the iconic kelp working group for conservation policy, outreach, education, and communication. And then this research group, which is, if you're a scientist, uh, then this would be a good research, a good uh, working group for you to join and uh, talk about kelp research. And these are the questions in the poll that we'd ask your engagement on it here. Number one, as a diver, how concerned are you about kelp disappearing in Monterey? And these are kind of like, they go from one to 10, right? Where where one is like, you know, I don't think it's a problem. It's, it's not urgent. And number 10, it's really urgent. So in your opinion, how urgent is the urgent is the urgent uh, kelp crisis? And uh, do you think divers should intervene to, uh, to restore kelp? And uh, in your opinion, how important is it for Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary to restore and monitor kelp forests. Give people a little bit of time for that. Didn't take me long to figure out how I feel. Well, oh, good. I know my answers, but I want to know yours, right? The important thing in all of these groups is that if there's a diver's representative, that they come informed with what the opinions are of their constituents, right? They're not elected people, they're appointed people. And it's not up to them what they think. It's up to them to be a conduit for what you think because you they are representing you and in this case i'll represent you and to this group and Alyssa will represent you to the state can we take just a second and talk about like what is the case for natural recovery maybe i have a bias that i i yeah I'm, well I'm, i mean I uh bias. yeah that's a good point i i uh i've it's one of those things where i i, I believe in it i just never seen it <laughs> like like Kelp will come back. It's, you know, urchins are, you know, they move around, they're patchy and, and they come and go. And, and we had some natural recovery in Monterey where out there by uh, Coral Street and Asilomar Beach, there was a big two mile long stretch of bull kelp that formed after the urchins had eaten all the giant kelp. And then the urchins ate that and then they moved inshore. And basically they ate the giant kelp, they moved inshore and then bull kelp formed in their wake when they weren't there. And then the urchins turned around and ate that. So um, there's just more and more urchins all the time, you know, and the hope is that there's some natural recovery that if the urchins were to leave it alone or they were to die from disease or, um, or maybe the kelp just does really well uh, with otters, perhaps there could, there's some opportunities for natural recovery to happen. Um, we just so like, really haven't so seen like it taking um growing the sun sun stars in or the sun whichever the sun, the sun star. Yes. yeah growing those in the lab and then reintroducing reintroducing them into high urchin areas would be considered intervention it's not natural recovery it's like assisting natural recovery yeah it'd be assisting natural recovery right because this sunflower stars were a natural part of that environment i i would say that it's a it's a long it's going to be a long road until we can reintroduce sunflower stars back into the Monterey Bay because they're from a different place 
and uh, they're from the Washington state because all of the ones here are not around anymore. And likely they would die uh, because we still have that the sea star wasting disease. So I think in terms of, of that reintroduction, it starts with the healthy kelp forest. And, and that's where a lot of effort comes in. But, but, but that's a great question. And that's something that we can discuss at working groups, you know, and, and educate I was just about, about to say that. that's probably better for the actual, you know, science advisory boards and mm -hmm. such that are yeah. consulting with all of the other various community groups. You know, I'm not a particular, you know, involved scientist. I have a lot of science background, but I'm not involved with this research ongoing. Um, so I would delve to, you know, the active researchers and what the data shows. I'm never going to speculate, you know, even based on my own observations, I can have my own opinion, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I would always go to the science and see what the data says too. And if we're not seeing success here, why not, right? Maybe some other region elsewhere in the world is seeing success and why? And those are good questions to start asking for, you know, development of this plan. Well said. Why don't we go ahead and move along from that, that group of questions here. And we're going to go to talk a little bit about Tankers Reef uh, and the future of that. And we have some questions around that as well. i going to advise you about uh, how this is. In the past, we've had difficulty in obtaining permission in Monterey. We tried in 2017 and 2019. And then in 2020, we had a lot of, a lot of people came and got involved and wrote letters and appeared at the commission meetings and it became legal. Uh, in April 1st of 2021, and it'll remain that way until April of next year. And we're trying to get a five-year extension uh, with the Fish and Game Commission right now, and that's an ongoing process. Uh, we tried to expand in 21, that was denied. Uh, we did a, a blueprint uh, for kelp restoration uh, as a restoration management plan, that was denied. We prohibited, we tried to prohibit fishing in kelp forests, that was denied. Uh, we applied for a scientific collecting permit uh, 18 months ago, and perhaps we'll have that in April of 2024. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that is. And now, effective today at five o'clock is the deadline. You all, you all missed it. Uh, was the decadal management review petitions uh, to actually change the rules of the MPAs, and we're petitioning to call urchins in all the MPAs. Uh, well, it's the state marine conservation areas first. Uh, Barbara asked the question, isn't there a meeting coming up on December 14th? Yes, there is. Thank you for asking. Uh, you can, it's in San Diego, and we did a little webinar on that on Tuesday. Uh, uh, you're welcome to come to that. Uh, we can post the, the agenda for that uh, at the end here. Um, it's in San Diego. You can zoom into it. You can write letters. You can come there to San Diego. I mean, it's San Diego. It should be nice, right? Uh, and uh, I'll be there. <laughs> so we're going to try that's the decision meeting for tankers reef to try and try and keep tankers reef going go the next one so this is what happened at tankers reef over the last few years so when we first appeared there in 2021 uh, we, we laid down this underwater cable grid on the, the shale and then uh and when, once we did that, a kelp forest formed not on our spot. And it appeared north of us as in this blue color. And um, it was six acres of kelp. We tried to defend it, but we had to concentrate on the grid. So we had to kind of leave that and come over here to the, um, to the area on the grid and work on that. In 2022, we had all this kelp grow on, on the area. Basically, we, this kelp became adult and reproductive and it spread spores all over on the south side of the reef. And in 2022, we even had kelp that was growing out in this area where we hadn't been calling urchins at all. The urchins, maybe they came into this area to their demise. And in 2023, we saw some kelp spontaneously grow. Here's your natural kelp recovery. Uh, out here towards the harbor, some, some kelp came in. Um, and we, we even saw some more recently down in this area, um, by, by the, right by the beach. Um, and these are the limits of our calling. This hat shape is 25 acres, where this red square is two and a half acres. So it's an order 10 times more area than in that calling area. And the results of this, uh, these are a little bit dated, but on the 
at Tankers Reef, the, when we the urchin numbers, we reduced them dramatically in, in only five months. Uh, and then we maintained it uh, through through some time. So, uh, and then the, on the control, the urchins remain pretty much the same. Uh, there, there's a little bit of a drop in it, um, but it actually was gone up now again. But that's what's happened with the urchins. That's what you would expect from the diver effort. And what you have now is the kelp. So um, the kelp, uh, this is on the restoration project. You can see there was not much kelp at first. Kind of went down while we we're doing some work. And then here it is. This is the kind of graph you want for kelp recovery, right? Like it told, it, it, there's all these types. Of, the units are a little strange. Uh, this is per meter square of stipes on the project. And the control, there was only like one kelp. And it was very scared. So in the future, what we're trying to do through our scientific collecting permit application is to restore kelp at more places. More this, Here's where Tanker's Reef is. And that's this project we're working on. Um, here is breakwater. We're, we're calling it Brigadier Gardens. And that's a small area there we're trying to uh, start. Otter Cove, further down the coast. This is closer to Coral Street. People are familiar with that. And Stillwater Cove in Carmel Bay and Stewart's Cove, also in Carmel Bay. Let me give a little blow up on each one. So at Bigger Deer Gardens, the breakwater all along the wall is uh, an obvious choice. It'd be easy to administer that one. You just set a depth contour at a certain tide <laughs> and just go along the wall uh, and get those urchins. So uh, and then Middle Reef is the other area. The, the other advantage of this and all the other places is that there's long-term monitoring that's already happened at these places. So we already know what the baseline is over time. Um, sorry to interrupt you, Keith. Can you be a little Go bit more it. clear about what you meant by that little, like, are you putting down traps or like, what is the process by which collection is happening here? I'm a little unclear. Yeah, we're not, we're not collecting any urchins. We're just calling urchins. Oh, so, okay, got yeah, it, I got it. Yeah, yeah, we just, we just uh, use a hammer, a little slag hammer, and we go and call the urchins. It's much more efficient that way than than trying to pick them all up, especially when they get small. Uh, on, on and you the, guys, you keep account of that and you're not at all worried about the, the spores from the urchins repopulating or? That's interesting. That was, uh, what, what you said about the, the spores, well, they're, they're spawn, right? There's males and females. I don't know if they're spores or they're yeah, gonads yeah. or whatever. So th there was like this myth that, that was actually really uh, promoted by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, that if you call the urchins, you'll make more urchins. And I think it was largely a tactic to get people to not call the urchins. People were doing it all the time. But if we have never seen it. It happened in a lab with, with healthy urchins that when they smacked them, there was some spawning that happened, I guess. But it doesn't, we haven't seen it in the wild. We haven't like looked back and seen a bunch of urchins spawning. But what happens is that when you call urchins, you mostly get the big ones and what remains are little ones. And so you made more, more habitat available for little urchins. And so we get so many little urchins and they're really hard to get. So, um, it, and it's kind of the same difference, right? Like if you were to start calling urchins and then stop, you might just get more urchins for a year for, <laughs> for all the effort you put into it. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we'll go on to the next site. So this is our uh, project at Otter Cove that we want to propose. There's a kidney-shaped kelp forest there that has managed to hang on for years. And we thought it was a goner. And we went there and surveyed it. There was urchins in there that were empty. They were going to eat that kelp. But then 16 sea otters showed up. And they are living on this reef. And they are keeping this kelp forest alive by eating the healthy urchins in the kelp forest as they come from the barrens into that kelp forest. And yeah, I mean, it totally worked, you know, and I'm, they're out there right now and I'm glad, right? Like it, <laughs> they're out there working when we don't have to. Uh, the next site is at Stillwater Cove, which is a little difficult. Uh, it's at Pebble Beach. Uh, there's a, a shore access from the pier right there. And there's some kelp forest uh, that is still remaining in the mooring field uh, at, at the Pebble Beach. There is a control site here that uh, is a lot of science goes on in this place and reef check surveys there and they have uh, admitted to me sadly that uh, this kelp forest which we saw that was uh, a giant kelp dominated kelp forest is now transitioned to a bull kelp forest and the other 
place is uh, Stewart's Cove, which is south. You're probably familiar with the Butterfly House, further to the north. Uh, this is the area. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to get to. It's a long swim from shore to get out here. Uh, there is a little uh, staircase right here that I've heard is broken. So uh, when, there's going to be some challenges out at this place. It may have to be done by boat or, or some other means. So, but those are the the ones we have for uh, for if we can get our scientific collecting permit approved by this spring. That's when once we'll start. Uh, in calling urchins, we want to do more than just call urchins, right? So there's other processes for uh, urchin suppression and for kelp enhancement. So we want to call the urchins, also bait and trap the urchins. Uh, like you were saying, Julia, like we could do that too, right? And and the commercial harvest, uh, this is something that our uh, red urchin fishermen friends can certainly help with, is uh, harvest the purple urchins and feed them into a ranching program where they're fattened up again and become food for people. Uh, there's a certain minimum size for that. And then managing acid weed. Acid weed is, is the most undiscovered, unwritten story out there. There's acid weed in all the regions of California. It has a pH of 2.6, and uh, it's very detrimental to kelp growth. It tangles up in the kelp, but it's also beneficial because the urchins eat it, it dissolves their teeth, and then they can't eat for three months. So we're going to have to figure out how to manage that natural resource. Uh, we want to remove invasive species that take up space. If there was sargassum in this area, we want to identify it and be able to remove it. Uh, kelp planting and transplanting is uh, uh, some kelp enhancement techniques with little bags of fronds that are held up by a goodie bag with the Clorox bottle in it, and they sprinkle spores all over the reef, and they can um, start a kelp forest from scratch in where we when we remove the urchins. And we want to manage the kelp canopy by cutting it. Now pruning is a natural process for kelp and it happens uh, all the every time, you know, before the storms and it's better if we can prune it and have the storms not pull the kelp out by the whole fest. So that's the idea behind that. And then we want to prohibit fishing in the restoration areas because it's, fish are a functioning part of the ecosystem and taking the fish out of it is not helpful. And it's dangerous to us as divers and, and there's there's fishing going on all around us and dropping hooks on us and there's propellers and all that. So um, that'll come up eventually uh, in our fishing game uh, petition. So last question of the night. Um, I have a question. Is there yes. a distinction made between people who are doing sort of like um, trawling or line fishing and, and versus spear fishing, which is a little bit more integrated and intentional in those spaces, or is it just fishing kind of broadly? Well, the, the difficulty in all of this is that as soon as you say, fishermen, I don't want you to go there, all the fishermen protest, right? So the idea of how to do it is to just change the designation of the state marine conservation area to a state marine reserve. That way there's already accepted rules about it, about how that could be administered. And in areas like, um, like the breakwater, spear fishing is not allowed right now, only hook and line. So by making it a reserve, that that stops the hook and line fishing in that area. Um, there's, there's some, generally speaking, these state marine conservation areas where fishing is allowed are very depleted of species and the fish are very small. And so the idea of closing them down for a period of time, and then we could take a look at reopening them in the future. And maybe we change the way we go about doing it, you know, and in coordination with scientific efforts, right? Maybe we target lingcod or, or target blue rockfish that are more pelagic something like that good question um so, i also had another yeah. question about sorry <laughs> some of questions for me um about the life cycle of the kelp i remember in conversation with someone they were telling me that that it has a dieback rate like it's it's seasonal in some sense mm -hmm. Is, yeah. Am I on the right? Well, no, no, you're right. Uh, it, giant kelp is what I'm talking about is, is um, a perennial. And in the wintertime, it does die back. Uh, it, but it never it doesn't disappear. It just, the canopy disappears pretty much. But um, it wasn't, I mean, in my remembrance, in my opinion, in my recollection, there's kelp, there was thick kelp mats all year. And when you would dive at, say, Maccabee or butterfly house you would go out a very short distance and have to go under the kelp because it was there all the time but that's a perennial but now 
bulk help is the other side of this equation and bulk help is a is an annual and it dies back every year and that's a different strategy for survival this strategy is that go ahead and eat me my kids will be back here same time next year but giant kelp is a different strategy his strategy is i'll live uh, i'll grow so fast you can't possibly eat me <laughs> Alyssa. yeah i was just gonna add um i'm actually doing um well have done and i'm doing another project for my uh, gis um graduate work that i'm working on specifically on kelp forest because we get to pick any topic and of course that's what i'm going to pick mm -hmm. and all of the data is always taken at the same time of year for that seasonality aspect or it's taken at two opposite times of year so that way there's some kind of average included in that data set so when scientists are analyzing kelp biomass over time they're always thinking about that seasonality because like keith said there's always that trade-off but to your point keith it doesn't fully disappear right there is right. less during the slower periods, but it shouldn't fully disappear unless there are other circumstances getting into urchins, warmer waters. Is that the other thing. Exactly. Yeah. Because giant kelp will live on granite substrates for seven to eight years at a time. Um, so, and where bull kelp lives for one year, right? Or maybe two, if it, you know, doesn't senesce. So, and so the pruning aspect is it allows it to stay rooted. Can you go over that? Yeah. So, so that? pruning, like, I'm going to take one step back and say that there used to be another animal in this ecosystem that was called a sea cow. And there was herds of them. And when they would just go and eat the kelp, they evolved to be buoyant and not go and eat the kelp. So they would just be in these kelp forests, rolling around in it, eating it all the time. But when the sea otters were extirpated, or nearly extirpated here, the kelp disappeared because all the abalone and urchins flourished. They ate all that kelp. And uh, for 125 years, was, there was no kelp on the Monterey Peninsula. All the kelp that, that we view in our lifetime is a recent restoration that was accomplished by abalone and urchin fishermen that went there and took those abalone and put them in cans. And they did that so well that we had to prohibit abalone fishing south of the Golden Gate Bridge in 1997. So that was a lot, but that's good news because kelp is very resilient, you know, and kelp restoration has happened here before. And it was, they thought that there was so many abalone that you could not possibly take them all. They wouldn't bother taking them off the rocks unless they were five high, right? Hopkins Reef was abalone and bull kelp. That, that's what it was. So as conditions change over time, our generational view of it is is limited by our own observations. And there's an, a tendency to think of the things that happened in your own lifetime as being normal and to kind of normalize this gradual and continuous environmental degradation over time. So in my opinion, what we're trying to do is turn this around and say, we're going to make this better than we found it. And we're going to restore it like people did previously. So I don't even know what the question was anymore. <laughs> did I approach your question? What was your question? Again? Uh, it was a, it was about the, so you were talking about the pruning. You go yeah. in and you prune yeah. the top of the kelp. Right. And that allows the storms to come through and not rip it from yeah. its roots. Exactly. It's not a root, but it's like a root. It's hold fast. Yeah. So it, at Tanker's Reef in particular, it's very, it's an ablative uh, surface. It's always decaying. So if the storm comes through, it'll just tear the whole thing off and end up on the beach. You'll see the hold fast like sheared off. Right. So it's a natural process of of the of the kelp forest to reduce that. And once you remove the kelp canopy and you cut it off, the, the kelp just sends up another stipe. Right. That's like the terminal bud on a tree. And once you remove it, it sends hormones down and then it sends up another stipe and just gets thicker and then it becomes reproductive. Right. And it most kelp, we could really get into this, but most most kelp children are within 10 feet of the parent. So by, by putting that canopy, it gives sunlight and ability for the kelp to come and and grow the kelp forest outward along uh, along its perimeter. Yeah, um, and that, I, one thing I didn't hear from this conversation, sorry for interrupting, is the um, the conversation about the carbon sink and the value of that to like mm. broader environmental initiatives. 
Yeah, so kelp sequesters 20 times more carbon than trees, right? If you look at a kelp leaf, it has photosynthesis on both sides, right? That's that's how how good kelp is. And a lot of it ends up on the beach, but it also does take some of the kelp and bury it really deep in the water. And that's the carbon sequestration that um, that we need <laughs> to, to combat climate change. Um, yeah, there's lots of other benefits too. I mean, it controls beach erosion, you know, sea level rise. <laughs> yeah. Only um, like you say, I, like it's burning and no one knows it. I mean, we have this kelp forest burning out there and no one even knows it's burning because, you know, as uh, you know, they say that the, the ocean is a desert with its life underground. And you <laughs> realize it's a problem. Um, I was also going to add, Keith, that I believe the indigenous tribes along the coast also practice, I don't know if it is necessarily pruning or just sustainable harvesting of the kelp, um, but there is historical evidence that that has been done uh, for generations prior to, um, you know, noticing the otters having an effect as well, at least from the human perspective. So that is also something that I think going into the various groups that are all helping to inform on this management plan and the things that the sanctuary is doing with Keith, uh, noting as well those various groups having indigenous um, bring their wealth of knowledge from their historic contributions is really important too. Yeah, I did take a, a foraging class and they kind of taught us about the different kelp and how it could be harvested and how to do it sustainably and what you can do in terms of using that as a food source. And I think that almost goes in tandem with creating excitement about effort toward uh, rebuilding this. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of uh, effort around uh, kelp aquaculture. Uh, coming up and that's a very interesting topic and it's something that people can eat kelp too right so um it's a valuable resource and, and keith it is getting to that seven o'clock mark we want to open it up for any other general questions i figured this is towards the end right i believe that that's is that is the last slide yeah exactly right. I, I should have flipped the slide so <laughs> <laughs> very good anyone else have any questions uh we can see what's in the chat here yeah i have one question um, i just posted it video there's a um there's a filmmaker here in california named adam hussein who was a student of mine in a freediver course and he's done a little bit of filming in monterey and he's actually putting together a feature link documentary called seaforestation so if anybody's interested in that i put the link to the trailer for it he's actively making uh this documentary right now and it features primarily california but he's actually going to kelp forests all over the world to create awareness um, and is actually drafting a video for the for the UN Climate Change Council. So pretty cool stuff if, if anybody's interested. But my question specifically has to do with uh, how can we have an organized effort for free diver initiative? Because a lot of this is scientific scuba diving. And although I'm a scuba diver myself, I primarily teach free diving. And I know there's a large community who want to be active in this field and wonder from both of you your opinions on the best way to organize and do that to be part of that initiative yeah you're you. very timely here Lisa, you wanted to all right no, I can address. Yeah, yeah so, I know we've talked about this before yeah we've been talking about this and talking about you brandon and uh what we'd like to do is get get with you and um develop a free diving part of the kelp restoration project. We think that that's a valuable thing to do and that um, there's there's opportunities uh, for free divers to participate uh, in water that's between five feet and 25 feet of water. Um, and basically it has a, a float tube with a, a float line to a hammer and the hammer stays in the bottom. And you would just kind of go there and call the urchins and, and then, uh, and then leave the hammer there and then someone the next diver or you can come back down and keep calling the urchins and um we're trying to develop that a little bit maybe we put a gps device in the float so we know where you all were and we're modifying our data portal uh, to accommodate that uh some different inputs from free divers because it'd be different right uh, you can count the urchins but it's like how many dives did you do maybe we have some different questions yeah, it, get, that it, gets a, it gets a little more challenging with that. But if, yeah, if we could develop an organized system and I would be happy to learn and be able to teach that to others and lead in organized groups, um, that way there's no resources wasted as far as people wanting to get active uh, yeah. in protecting help. 
Exactly. Exactly. That's yeah, awesome. You know, Brandon and uh, you and I have already talked about me getting you in the water and just going out there on scuba and doing the already brought up now uh, certification course and getting you going on that. So that way you have a good frame of reference too. So. Yeah, hundred percent. So I'll, I'll connect with both of you after this. I know Alyssa, we've got to do that. And Keith, I'm, I'm happy to finally talk to you and I'd love to uh, get with both of you and um, yeah, and, and build on that because like I said, I know there's a lot of interest. I haven't um, had the time or effort put towards it yet, but coming into this new year, that's something that I care about quite a bit and I, I want to see that and, uh, and contribute. So yeah, I'll look forward to that. Definitely. And anybody who's a free diver, will get out there and uh, make a difference as well. Exactly. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also wanted to highlight just because we have a group of people, you know, fighting for general rights and using the kelp forest and enjoying all that it has to offer that Brandon um, went out and contacted the California Coastal Commission and was able to, you know, fight for something that free divers and spear fishermen have been dealing with for some time with kind of butting heads with Pebble Beach and he took them head on mm. and finally got them to publicly admit, okay, we're not going to be doing this anymore and shooing away, you know, spear fishermen that are perfectly within their rights to enter those waters and yeah. take fish legally. So uh, kudos to you, Brandon. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I might get assassinated next time I'm in Pebble Beach, but uh, <laughs> I'll write a perfect cause and I'll do the same for the kelp. So, you know. Wonderful. Alicia. Hey, I just had a quick follow-up question of how to get more involved with the working groups that are coming up. Yeah. So uh, my email is right there, Keith at G2KR. Just shoot me a, a, an email and let me know you're interested and uh, I'll connect you. And it's also in the poll too, that the last question was, um, you know, do you, are you interested in the working group or are you interested in being on the working group uh, or hearing updates? So, so we will look at that information and we can use that to to reach out to you at uh, we'll send you an email when these things come up perfect thank you so much and thanks for all your time and all this information it was really awesome thanks alicia and i posted another link to a short film that was done by the nature conservancy about um kelp forests and urchin culling and it, it shows the sort of side of the commercial fishermen which we didn't hear a lot about tonight but it's a it's a great little piece great thank you Awesome. Any, any other questions from anybody? Um, are, there, are there not enough otters or are they eating other things now? I, this is a question from Lauren. Uh, yeah, the otters are an interesting thing because the, the sea otters are normally counted and monitored by the U.S. Geological Service. Um, and this guy's uh, name is Joe Tomerleone. And uh, they haven't done a survey of the sea otters since 2019. Usually they do a census every year, but they haven't done one in a while because COVID and they lost their plane or whatever. And so there was 3,000 sea otters uh, in the Central Coast region, uh, which is up from the 55 they were when they were uh, some time ago. But uh, they don't seem to be making much of a recovery. Uh, it was, their numbers were going down. And but then what happened was that the Alpha's kelp deforestation, it, it's wrecks their habitat for foraging. And so what we've seen in, in this last winter coming in the spring, it happened, I guess, February or so, we started seeing all these sea otters start showing up in Monterey Bay that we never saw before. And there was rafts of 250 of them right in front of the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And they're really skittish because they've never seen people before because they were down the Monterey, now on the Big Sur coast, you know? And so... Will they go back to the Big Sur coast? Did they go back? I don't know. Where are they? Did they go to Elkhorn Slough? Doesn't seem like it. You know, like we're not sure about the otter population right now, but we've seen that the ones that are here are, there's not a lot of food for them because there's not a lot of kelp. And what they've been doing is eating, uh, foraging for mussels in the inner tidal, um, which is, a brutal way to live you know they just grab a hold of the muscles on the rock and let the waves just pound them one way or the other and rip the muscles off the rock and that's what they eat so um you know i i wish i had a better handle on that and we we're asking the u.s geological service to to really ask the information is something that we've asked the sanctuary to give us that information as well so it, it's an open question and i i think 
CRs are a proven apex predator in a kelp forest system, and we love to have them. We love to have more of them, but you know, it starts with a healthy kelp forest for them to forage in, and that's where we come in. Great, thanks for the answer. Thanks, Lauren. Any other questions before we depart here? We're seven minutes over time. Hey. Okay. Thank you so oh. much. This was incredible. This is really top top notch. All right. Thanks, yeah, Julia. Alyssa, thank you so much for what you do. Thank you. Appreciate that. 100%. I'll look forward to talking to you both soon. I hope everybody has a nice night. Yeah. Long with the kelp. All right. And feel free to email both of us. I know Keith already said that, but you know, yeah. same thing here. Any questions or you know, specific opinions you want brought forward to the um working group. Our next meeting is going to be on December 18th, just so you guys are aware. So if you have any thoughts, you know, in the shower, which is where I always do my best thinking, feel free to shoot me an email. After the back. It's fine. Email you in the shower? Uh, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> my room is going that way. All right. Fair enough. All right. Have a good evening, everybody. Thanks, guys. Night.